Fantastic. So good evening um, and welcome to Terpsy's webinar tonight aimed at communication professionals. Tonight we will cover an introduction to Interpreter's role space, rethinking our place in interactions. So before we go through the introductions, I'll briefly go through housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded and available for playback afterwards. So you can take notes, but you can also listen again and you'll get a copy of the presentation and all of the questions afterwards as well. So this is a fantastic opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. Um, and the presenters have been really, really forthcoming with some wonderful answers. So the good thing about these webinars is the fact that they're anonymous. You can ask these questions and not be worried about what people are going to think about your opinions or your views. So do share. Um, that's the whole point in these webinars. Um, it's to encourage you to take away some thoughts or some feelings about your work as a communication professional. We'll have a Q&A session at the end, as always, but I would encourage you to type in your questions throughout the session. Um, oh, and I'll put them to Robert at the end. So I'll just be stacking them up um, for Robert at the end of the webinar. So let's first of all make some introductions. My name is Victoria Williams. I'm the director of Terptree. I've been involved in the deaf community ever since my cousin was diagnosed as deaf, and Max is now 22. And in that time, I've worked in various deaf-related charities and organizations, as well as qualifying as a BSL interpreter, registering as an RSLI back in 2005. So when I qualified and worked within the community as a freelance interpreter, I continued to notice many ways which I could use my passion and skills to have a real positive impact on the community. And soon after this recognition, Tertree was born. So let's move on to um, the main man this evening, Robert. Um, Robert Lee came to UCLan, so he's currently working at UCLan from Boston in the US. Robert is a certified American Sign Language interpreter and has worked for over 20 years in various settings, specializing in medical situations and conference interpreting. Robert is actively um, working in the area of research um, within various areas um, such as language, linguistics, culture and society. And he's also a member of the research unit for speech and language. Um, now, this doesn't even go to touch um, Robert's experience over the years. Um, but instead of me um, telling you any more, I'm going to literally hand over to Robert, who will go straight on to our amazing session this evening. So really enjoy. And like I said, keep those questions coming. Um, and I hope you enjoy your webinar. Thank you, Victoria. Um, <laughs> I'm just a little worried about the expectations. Um, just hold on with the... I'm now showing my screen and excellent. <laughs> um, again, thanks for that introduction and hello to everybody. Um, I'm Robert Lee. Um, I go by Robert G. Lee just because it's it's just easier that way for me because Robert Lee sounds like it's one big word. Um, um, just here's the outline for what we're going to talk about tonight, um, and again, I, I'm going to leave enough time for questions, and I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, as Victoria said, she'll be um, moderating that, that aspect. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my background um, and the background of what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about some general principles of interaction, um, because one of the theories that we have is that unless we know how people interact in one language, it's silly to talk about them going across languages. Um, we'll talk about some quote-unquote traditional roles for interpreter, and I'll say this again, and any any of you who have ever heard me before, I think role has been a four-letter word. It's been very problematic for us, and we'll talk about why. Um, in, we'll talk about the role-space model that was developed by myself and Peter Llewellyn Jones. Uh, we'll talk about some applications, uh, some specific examples, and then some conclusions, implications, and then over to you guys. Um, so um, let me just share a little bit about my background. I've been actually, <laughs> what v Victoria read is slightly outdated because I'm, I'm pushing 30 years now <laughs> as an interpreter. Um, I actually started out um, doing sign language as a teenager just because it was an interesting thing to do. Um, and then I, got, I fell into the idea that ASL was a proper language, American Sign Language, because I was from the States. Um, and I wanted to do linguistics. That was my passion. And back at the time in the 80s, <laughs> there was no such thing, for example, as um, deaf studies programs. Uh, there was um, teachers of the deaf programs, which like in most places, didn't require sign language, which at the time 
I thought was ridiculous and I still think is. <laughs> and then there were interpreter training programs where they taught American Sign Language. And so that's why I, I decided to, to go into uh, an interpreter training program um, with a deaf woman named Eileen Forrestal. So if any of you um, are interested in the, in the role of deaf interpreters, Eileen has done a PhD in lovely, fascinating work on the role of deaf interpreters. She was a deaf woman running an interpreter training program from the 70s. Um, and I told her I just wanted to learn ASL to do linguistics. I don't want to be an interpreter. Um, there's, a, there's an old saying that says, if you live long enough, you eat your words. And I never wanted to be an interpreter, nor did I want to teach. And now I teach interpreting. So if you live long enough, <laughs> apparently you eat all of your words. Um, so I actually uh, trained as an interpreter, moved um, to uh, from New Jersey, where I was trained, to Boston in the States, which is a city for deaf people, vibrant deaf community, great interpreting community, and I was about the eighth or ninth male interpreter in the city, um, and so I was kind of dropped into interpreting very early, and I, I fell in love with interpreting when I realized that somebody would say something in one language, I would do something, and somebody understood it, and that went back and forth. Um, so um, I that kind of made got, got me hooked on interpreting, and I've been hooked ever since. Um, and again, my background is I did um, a lot of medical interpreting. I worked as a staff interpreter at a hospital, a lot of conference interpreting, a lot of educational interpreting and, and um, higher education. Um, and then I initially came to the UK in, in 2004, 2005 as a visiting lecturer at UCLan um, just for six months, went back to the States, and then came back three years later. So I've been here almost seven and a half years, actually. I think I just passed my 7.5 year anniversary um, where I run the uh, postgraduate diploma and MA and teach a variety of things at UCLan. So that's me. Um, I'm still a practicing interpreter, although not as much as I would like to. Um, I, I really do miss interpreting. and I, I do do some um, BSL uh, interpreting, but I prefer ASL, obviously, is my, my dominant sign language. Um, and so I'm still a practitioner. So for those of you out there who are sign language interpreters, Interpreters, I, <laughs> I feel for you, <laughs> um, and I do miss interpreting as much, um, but I do as much as I can. So uh, that being said, that's enough about me. Um, just in terms of where uh, this came from, when I moved here, Pete Llewellyn Jones and I, um, Pete, many of you know, runs uh, Sign Languages International SLI down in Lincolnshire, and um, we were working together, and we realized even though. Um, He's slightly older than I am <laughs> and working slightly a few more years than I have. Uh, and we came from very different backgrounds and very different you know, cultural contexts and, and um, deaf contexts. We both had very similar ideas about what we thought interpreters, what, what makes effective interpretation. Um, and we both taught in a similar way and we both talked about things in a similar way. So this led us to say, um, let's try to put that down on paper um, and actually August was five years ago that we actually came up with the model that I'm going to talk about tonight. So it's it's five years old now, so it's a little over a toddler. Um, and we have a book that's in the references that just came out last year. Um, and we think we've we've at least codified what, what we think in successful interpreting is um, or to help explain some of the factors that make successful interpreting. Right, so enough of that, me blabbing on about me. Um, let's talk um, now about some general principles of interaction. And part of the reason we did this is this whole idea of role has been very problematic. Um, Cynthia Roy, um, back in the, in the 90s, wrote an article talking about the problems of metaphors. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. You know, interpreters are just like telephones. They're like televisions. They're like holograms. There's all these things that we're not. You know, we are no long, more like telephones than we are like refrigerators. You know, we're human beings. Um, so a lot of the metaphors we were using were not um, helpful. Um, and what we wanted to do is try and model what makes interpreted interaction successful. And Pete and I started initially by looking back at our own work when things have been successful and <laughs> when things have not been so successful um, because we all do unfortunately have to learn from our mistakes as well. Um, so that's kind of the impetus. Um, there's going to be, a, there's a bunch of references in the end and I'm going to mention a bunch of theorists and, and not to just to, to to bowl people over, but just to, to talk about the fact that we really looked at a variety of factors that can that can help us understand how people relate to each other. Um, and I'm going to go through some of these specifically, but I just want to give you a sense of, of where we came from and how we, we came to this model of interpreting. 
So kind of the, again, the, the fancy dancy university words, the theoretical underpinnings of rule space. Basically, who did we look at that we thought explained human communication in a, in a way that was helpful to us um, as practitioners and as teachers of interpreting? Um, we looked initially at, at without, we, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a bit, we, we didn't talk about interpreting. We wanted just to talk about how people interact. So we went back to sociology and sociolinguistics. Um, two of the names, well, one of the names, well, two of the names, actually, they might not be familiar to anybody. Um, R. Linton is a guy named Ralph Linton, which is, believe it or not, from 1936, um, who was a sociologist who had some really interesting things to say about the idea of role. Um, so, and it's not about the terms of role of interpreter, but what, how, the roles that people play. Um, Irving Goffman is, might be familiar to some people as well. Um, he talked about this idea of presentation of self in everyday life. Um, again, not talking in terms of interpreting, talking about how people deal with their everyday uh, lives and, and the, the roles that we play, everything from parent to employee to employer to customer to um, uh, citizen. And R. Turner um, is, uh, interestingly enough, right before Goffman, and Goffman never really cited him, uh, although I think a lot of what Goffman talked about, Turner talked about, um, who talked, again, specifically about this idea of role, that we, we, we perform social roles in a variety of ways. So we looked at the fact that people are doing this every single day in interactions with people of the same culture and language. So that's one, some of the... Uh, the background that we have. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about these next two. Um, conversational alignment, again, has no, it's not related to interpreting. It's from um, linguistic theory talking about the fact that when two people are communicating, they're trying to get along and they're trying to align with each other. Um, and the same thing with accommodation. And again, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about this. These, again, are not um, interpreting related researchers. These are people who are researching general human communication. Um, and then Finally, uh, in terms of interpreting, amongst the people we looked at, um, which might be familiar to some people, Cecilia Vodensha, uh, who again we'll talk about in a little bit, Swedish researcher who was one of the first people to actually recognize, and acknowledge, and do research and say that interpreters are actually an integral part of the interactions in which they're interpreting. They're, they're not, we're not machines, we're not telephones, we're not those type of things. Cynthia Roy from the States, um, who very soon after also talked about that. Claudia Angelelli, some people may or may not know, uh, another researcher who did her PhD looking specifically at the interactions of medical interpreters. Um, and Danielle Claude Belanger, who we'll talk about, who is from Montreal, uh, who again talks about the, the primacy of the interpreter's place, that we can't ignore the fact that the interpreter is central. So, um, with all those names out of the way, and again, you'll have access to the, the PowerPoint and you can look them up and read them, read them at your leisure, let's talk about um, what do people do in quote-unquote normal monolingual interactions. So, we're talking about situations without an interpreter, we're talking about people who share a language, share a culture, um, who um, are trying to communicate, so not... Uh, um, antagonistic situations, so not arguments, <laughs> not fights, not court cases. Um, so what I'd like you to do when I go through the next couple of slides when we talk about what people do is think about the last kind of one-to-one -one conversation, normal, non-aggressive one-to-one conversation you had, whether it was a brief chat with a colleague, um, a chat with a partner or a friend or a family, just kind of keep that in mind about how you, and no matter what language it was, um, spoken or signed, um, keep in mind about the things that you did in that one-to-one -one interaction. And I'm going to go through some um, some ideas and I want you to reflect on your own experience and think about, oh yeah, that, that's an example of that. Um, and again, this might be a review for some of you who have um, obviously who might have read about this in university or some other area, but um, we just want to, I want to frame the, where the, the theory is coming from. So, um, the first thing we do um, goes back to a guy named Grice, who again may or may not be familiar, um, H.P. Grice, it's H. Paul Grice, I don't know what the H stands for, I always think it's something embarrassing because he never said, so it might be Hildegard or something. Um, Grice was a, uh, a sociolinguist um, in the 50s and 60s um, who came up with what he called this the idea of the cooperative principle. And it sounds obvious to us, and some of this does sound obvious, but again, it's not things that we are taught, it's things that we acquire 
as we develop and learn and acquire language and acquire the culture or cultures which we um, live in. And what, what Grice said is, look, when, when, except for arguments and the examples I've said before, people are, they want to cooperate with each other. And so in order to communicate, they follow this cooperative principle. Um, and this principle has kind of four sub-maxims, he called them, or rules. And he says, first thing is quality. He says, when people are communicating with each other, again, when they're trying to get along, when they're trying to cooperate, um, the first thing is quality. You, you say things that you know to be true, or you assume to be true. Um, and if you don't, you let people know. And, and that's one of the core things of Grice is that all of these basic rules we follow. And if we're not going to follow them, we let our conversational partner know that. So I, everything I say you assume to be true. And if I don't think it's true or I have, I have some doubt as to the veracity or the truth, I will say something. So I might say, I'm not sure about this, but, or I've heard it said that, um, and that's, that's a qualifier that says, look, the quality of what I'm going to tell you right now is suspect. But barring that, the assumption is everything I say is true. Um, again, and one thing to keep in mind for all of these, they're very linguistically based and they're very culturally and subculturally based. Um, so the example for quality is in um, British law and American law and most kind of uh, countries that are based on English common law, the idea of hearsay in court is, is very restrictive. So for someone to report what someone else said in a court of law is very limited. There's very limited times you can do that and um, for various and sundry reasons. So the fact that the quality of what somebody says is, is, is limited or suspect. French courts are very different. French courts have a much broader um, flexibility in terms of who can say what that somebody else said. So the whole idea of, of the, the quality varies from culture to culture and also from situation to situation. Uh, the next is quantity, and this might be familiar to some people. And what quantity basically says is always say the right amount of information, not too much, not too little. Um, we all have, I'm sure, people in our life who you ask them how they are, and instead of just saying fine or not so bad, they will give you a very, very long list of their ailments and maybe copies of their MRIs and, and x-rays, and they give you too much information. The reason people react to this too much information is these people are violating this maxim of qual uh, quantity, that they're telling too much information. Um, the other side is when you ask a friend you know, how they are, and they answer very curtly and say, fine, they're actually violating that maxim as well. They're, they're giving less information than, than we expect. So we have this cultural feel of how much is, it, is enough or not enough based on the situation, the relationship, um, and our interaction with these people. Uh, the next thing in terms of cooperating, what people do when they cooperate, is relevance. You say things that are relevant to the topic at hand. Um, and if you're going to violate that, just like the other maxims, um, you tell people. So you might say something like, oh, before I forget, let me tell you, or apropos of nothing, X, Y, and Z. So the idea is that you're recognizing that we're supposed to be talking about the same topic, but I'm going to violate that and let the other person know. And the final one is what's, what uh, Grice calls matter. So it's basically communicate in, in the way that's appropriate for the situation given the person. So, for example, how we talk to our children is different than how we talk to our older children, then it's different how we talk to our partner, our, our colleagues, our acquaintances, and our neighbor. Um, so the same piece of information, for example, that the cat died, <laughs> okay, how we say it to a neighbor might be very different than how we say it to a young child, for example. Okay? So the idea is that um, all in all, for the most part, people are attempting to cooperate, and in cooperating, they follow these rules. They tell the truth and they mark it if it's not, they give the right amount of information, they provide relevant information, and then they also um, do it in a way that's expected given, given the relations. So that's kind of the first thing. We assume people are cooperating. Um, the next thing, here comes that four-letter word, <laughs> role, um, is we enact roles. And Goffman um, again, Irving Goffman, late 50s uh, into the 60s and 70s, was um, one of the first sociolinguists to really talk about the fact that um, prior to this, distinctions were made between, again, before sign language research was actually recognized or even done, um, we had speakers and hearers, so people who use language and people who 
listen to language. So I'm, I'm actually going to use the term speaker and hearer a lot, but you should assume in your head speaker just means producer of language, whether it's spoken or signed, and hearer means um, receiver of language, again, whether it's spoken or signed. And what, what Goffman was very, very astutely said is, look, th this idea of speaker versus hearer, this binary split that we just have people either speak or they hear, isn't really enough to explain the complicated roles that happen. So what he did is he divided both speaker and hearer into subcategories. So in terms of speaker, he said, well, there's actually three different roles. Now, one person can, can be perform all of these roles or these can be divided up. And let me take you through it and then give you some examples. So the, the traditional thing when we think about a speaker is an animator, the person who actually produces utterances like I'm doing now. And again, for some of you who are not familiar or don't like American accents, it might be too much animation, um, but that's what I'm doing. The second role is um, what's called the author, so the person who selected the sent sent uh, sentiments and words. So I'm currently authoring the sentiments I'm telling you. However, <laughs> I'm also kind of quoting Goffman, for example, or I might be, quote, be uh, quoting Peter Llewellyn Jones. Um, but the idea is that I've selected the words, but I'm also animating them. And then the third is the principle. And that's a little more abstract. It's the person who's committed to what's said. So at the moment, because I'm explaining Goffman to you, I'm the animator, I am the author, and I am the principal. So any one of you can come back to me and say, look, you said, <laughs> and by confronting me, quote unquote, that way, you're talking to me as an animator, author, and principal, because I'm responsible for what I'm saying. You said Goffman said this. However, I read Goffman, and he said something different, which means that my animation might have been fine, my authoring might have been problematic, and as principal, I'm ultimately responsible. Um, probably the biggest or the best example to kind of tease apart these three roles where they, they, they are performed by different people is any political, um, especially any, any announcement from the government. So, for example, there might be a spokesman from um, the prime minister's office, not even the prime minister himself, or it might be the prime minister, who is the animator who says, you know, Currently, the government is going to do X, Y, and Z. So at the moment, the prime minister is the animator. The prime minister is probably not the author, <laughs> or at least not the only author of those sentiments, correct? Right? So there's probably a whole room full of people that we don't know about that all have to author this. And for example, if it's a, um, unfortunately to use recent examples, if it's a policy statement on uh, access to work through Department of Public uh, Work and Pensions, the principal the person who's actually responsible might be the minister for DWP. Okay, so one person's animating, actually producing the words, they were written by themselves and maybe other people, but who's ultimately responsible for that is the principal. Okay, we often think about these things as being the same way. And what I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind is thinking about what, do, what are we as interpreters? Are we merely animators? Are we authors? Or are we sometimes principals? Or are we sometimes all three? Okay. Um, so that's um, the speaker roles that, that Gelfman um, posited. And just because <laughs> he, has to be, he has to be clear, um, in terms of speaker roles, there's also the quote-unquote hero roles. Um, and again, he divides these up, and I don't want to, to, to dwell too much on this, but just to think about the fact it's not just someone who's perceiving the language. So there's addressees. So um, what's kind of difficult for me at the moment, and Victoria and I actually spoke about this, is you are all addressees, but I have no idea who you are. Um, I know Victoria, hopefully, is still out there, um, but I have no idea who the other, uh, the rest of you are. Okay, so your general addressees. Um, if, for example, in a classroom, it would be a group of students, but there's times you might also address a specific student. So if a student asks a specific question, I would address a, a response to them um, specifically. Um, the other category that, that Goffman posits is what's called a ratified recipient. It means a person who has the status as a per, um, participant. So again, using the classroom example, um, I'm lecturing to a group of people, I get asked a specific question, so even though I'm answering a specific student, the other students are ratified. They're allowed to hear that. Um, there's also um, what are Goffman calls recipients in general, which could be eavesdroppers, could be people walking by, could be people standing by, um, which may or may not be ratified. They, they probably couldn't break into the conversation, um, but they're still there. And the last is, um, again, this, this is not Goffman, but, but uh, someone called Bell, 
not Jason Bell, who you might have seen the webinar of earlier, but an earlier Arthur Bell, um, it talks about what's an auditor. So an addressee or ratified recipient can be an auditor. And the example I use is if any of you have ever been in education where a teacher is teaching you know, at, what, at whatever level and their, their supervisor comes in to observe them. Now, the supervisor is not there to learn and be the same kind of, kind of recipient as the students are. However, they are perceived as an auditor because they're evaluating the teacher, okay, and they have a different status. Um, and one of the things we, we might need to think about is that people, especially hearing people who are not used to having other um, people in the room with them, we might be perceived as auditors, um, which might be potentially negative. So the, the, the upshot is that our, the, the idea of just speaker and hearer or producer of language and receiver of language is a lot more complicated than just you know, talking, signing, or, or listening, seeing. Right. Um, next. Oops, sorry. Um, the next thing is um, that we looked at is what's called alignment, is the fact that um, people, when they're co again, when they're communicating with each other, they want to align with each other. They want to try to relate to each other. Um, and there's two flavors of this. Um, one of them is what's called sociolinguistic alignment. It's where we use this to increase or decrease social distance. So, um, for example, we might um, we want, might see, meet someone who's superior to us in terms of the hierarchy of our company, um, and we'll use honorifics like Mr. or Mr. or Vice President or Vice Chancellor <laughs> or titles, um, and that's used to increase the social distance and the person might say oh please you know call me Tom and that decreases the social distance okay so there's ways that we actually use language in that way um, to help us to um, relate to each other in kind of psychological distance. The other kind of alignment is what's called so uh, a psycholinguistic alignment, and that's where we jointly construct meaning. That's where we decide what topics we're going to talk about. We think about um, how we negotiate the interaction. Um, I might say something like, "Oh, so tell me about your holiday," and that becomes the topic of conversation. So we use um, this idea of alignment both in terms of how we relate to each other, um, in terms of dealing with social distance, but also. Um, to jointly construct meaning. Okay. Next, um, we have what's called accommodation. And accommodation, again, is very similar. It's um, again, one to one interaction you had with somebody, again, whether it was short or long. Um, the idea is that it accommodates to the people. So, Again, thinking about when you first asked monolink you had, um, you see some new um, not you you have this period of what's called convergence where you kind of come to a point where you you're going to be talking if you're passing in the hallway and you haven't seen someone in a while, you might say, "Oh, so how was your holiday?" And so you come to a point where you converge. Um, and you decide on the topic in terms of alignment. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I need to apparently go back a little bit. Um, how far back would you like me to go? Oh, oh went all strange. Is it better now? Ah, the start of this, this slide? Yep, yep, okay. <laughs> sorry, everyone. And technical glitches. Um, sorry. Uh, so accommodation theory basically um, says that people who are interacting accommodate to one another. Um, we accommodate in terms of how we talk to each other, the language we use, and um, we do that in a variety of ways. And again, it doesn't matter if the interaction is very short, a few minutes, um, or very long, a two-hour, <laughs> you know, chat, catch up over coffee. Um, and so we, um, what these um, accommodation theorists say is that we go through these stages um, of accommodating. And so back to this slide. So when we first meet somebody, um, again, whether it's just an acquaintance or you know a very good friend, we kind of converge. Um, so we come to a point where we're like, oh, hi, how are you? We might actually physically converge. We might physically get closer, um, and we decide on what we're going to talk about. So actually, the physical. Um, 
the physical space might be closer, but also the whole idea is that we actually kind of relate to each other on a much closer way. Um, and then we, we, we got to a point where that's the comfortable space that we're going to stay at, and that's basically maintenance. So we, you know, depending on the relationship to the person, again, if it's just a um, an acquaintance or if it's an old friend we haven't seen in a while, we'll get to that point, and, and many of you, again, you know, reflect on your own interactions with individuals where you sit there and you're in that space, you're in that that converged maintenance space. Um, now, one of the things I want to think about as we kind of slowly transition to, to talking about interpreting is what happens when there's a third person. So two of you, uh, you and a friend, are talking. Um, you're having you you've maintained. You're having this this conversation. You're aligning. You're talking about the same things. You're using the same te terminology. Sometimes in accommodation, we use the same words as the other person, even though they might not be words that we would use. And then a third person comes in. Well, if we want them to join, well, if we don't want them to join us, we'll actually kind of converge even closer. But suppose we want this third person to join us and be a part of um, the interaction. Well, in order for them to join it, because remember the participant A and B have kind of created this joint space, they have to diverge a little bit in order to allow the third person into the conversation. Um, so, I mean, sometimes, again, we do that physically. It's not always physical, but sometimes we just say, oh, by the way, so-and-so and I were talking about X and Z. So in order for, to allow that third person in, then the three parties can then converge. Okay? So the, and again, this is probably going to seem very familiar, and you probably know where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, but the idea is that, you know, for two people to communicate um, is different than when we have three people. Um, because even in, in, a, in a monolingual situation, it's not just um, everyone participating equally. Um, but the idea, in order for two people to communicate with each other when a third person is joining, it's important that they all kind of converge on each other. So, very long-winded <laughs> background, or, or maybe in some ways um, kind of short, um, about what people do in general monolingual interactions. So what I'd like to do now is turn to what happens when we're talking about interpreting, um, because there's going to be some similarities and, unfortunately, some perceived differences in what we're supposed to do. And this is where Peter Noel and Jones and I kind of came to, is that we noticed there were some schools of thought that proposed that there are rules for how interpreters should behave. And again, to broadly talking about defining their role, using this R word, as opposed to what we think is important is looking at what actually constitutes successful interaction. Um, and what um, you, we see in the literature or we see how, how practitioners um, and sometimes teachers talk about interpreting is that there are behaviors that are quote unquote part of the interpreter's role um, and anything outside of that is labeled as stepping out of role. Um, so let me give you some examples and maybe this will resonate with some of you. Um, in terms of rules for um, what's allowed, what's part of an interpreter's role, uh, regulating turn taking, uh, the speed of participants, so being the communication cop saying stop, hold on, that's usually allowed. Um, hopefully <laughs> asking for clarification, repetition and pauses. Um, repairing errors, again, hopefully if they're noticed in the interpretation. Um, telling people to look at or talk to, sometimes very strictly, don't look at me, look at the deaf person. Um, moving furniture, oftentimes we'll just drag a chair over and plop ourselves next to the hearing person, whether they like that or not. Um, positioning the speakers. Um, and in some schools of thought, being very, very distanced and referring to oneself as the interpreter, as in the interpreter would like a break. Um, the interpreter didn't understand that. Okay? There's some schools that say this is, this is normal um, for what inter how interpreters should interact. Again, thinking about what we just talked about, <laughs> how that seems a little odd in some ways. Um, the same kind of schools of thought would talk about things that are quote unquote stepping out of role. So for example, some people say you shouldn't introduce yourself. I, I remember um, a few times being told that oh, deaf pe only deaf people should introduce interpreters. Interpreters should never introduce themselves. That can be pr problematic because if you have a hearing person who's never dealt with a deaf person or an interpreter before, the first interaction they have is interpreted. Um, and it might be quite awkward if, for example, I'm a male interpreter, which I am, and the deaf person is female, and 
I'm not allowed to introduce myself, and so the first interaction the hearing person has, or the first thing they hear is, hello, my name is Sally, and this is Robert, my interpreter, and we're here for the meeting. So immediately the person is on their back foot because they have who so this guy is talking, but he said his name is Sally, but there's a woman sign, right? Incredibly problematic. Um, sometimes we're not we're told not allowed to react directly to what's being expressed, um, expressing an opinion. Although I would argue that when I say to someone, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'm expressing an opinion about the clarity of what they said. Uh, we're not allowed to draw attention to oneself, so we're, we're supposed to be quote unquote invisible according to some schools of thought. Um, and again, the problem with the metaphors is if we're supposed to be invisible, how the heck do the deaf people see us? That's a really bad metaphor to use. Um, and again, as opposed to being allowed to address, you know, talk about oneself as the interpreter, speaking of oneself in the first person, like I would like a break or I didn't understand that in some schools of thought is considered taboo. Now, one of the, the problems is, um, and Pete, Pete and I have talked about this, this in a bunch of different ways is that you we can't step out of role uh, and going back to some of the, the sociological theory that I mentioned earlier uh, in sociology roles are not something that we have there's something that we do we perform roles we don't have roles so the metaphors of kind of using the switching of hats or stepping in and out of a role um, don't really make sense um, we're performing roles and the example I often use is that um, you have a doctor a deaf patient and an interpreter and someone says, well, I stepped out of role and I gave the, I, I stepped out of role and I said, well, well, what, where did you go then? If you, you used to be the interpreter, that was the role, because there's three roles and three actors. So you stepped out of role, where did you go? Did you become the doctor? So what happened to the doctor? They became the patient and then the patient became the interpreter. And they said, well, well suppose an interpreter, you know, steps out of role and gives advice. I said, no, no, they're not stepping out of role. They're being inappropriate as the interpreter, which is the reason they could be brought up um, as violating the code, because they're doing things that are inappropriate, and they're doing it as the interpreter. If stepping out of role were a true thing, it's kind of like if you play tag and you're on base and you can't touch me and I can't become it. If someone says, oh, I stepped out of role, well, then you can't get me for a violation of the code because I wasn't acting as an interpreter there. So the whole idea of stepping out of role often is an excuse, and as we've said a couple of times in our in our work, um, for explaining behaviors that that feel appropriate, but are often um, not um, following what the current code might say. So, what are some unintended consequences of these things? Many of the quote-unquote allowed behaviors actually inhibit interaction. And by interaction, I talk about all the things that we, we talked about, enacting roles, aligning, accommodating, et cetera. Oops. Many of the disallowed behaviors are actually what's expected of people in an interaction, like we just talked about. What happens is this makes interpreters, first of all, seem odd and makes the interaction stilted. Um, and then the interpreter becomes perceived, again, as this idea of an auditor, that this, there's this person who won't, who won't play by the rules like everyone else is supposed to, um, and so in some ways become seen as an evaluator. And by the way, this whole idea of inter interpreters seeming odd and the interaction being stilted, the the really bad thing, I don't, you know, I don't care if people perceive me as weird, but the knock-on effect is that deaf people seem weird, problematic, and difficult to deal with because of interpreters' behavior. Um, and so the crucial thing is what see should seem to be a dialogue, even though it's not, a two-way dialogue, becomes a series of short monologues. So remember we have this idea of two participants and a third person, this participant C. Well, if that participant is the interpreter, what often happens is that the interpreter gets in the way. So instead of being having this convergence in a triangle, the interpreter literally gets in between the two participants. And what you end up having is this series of one-way interactions with the interpreter kind of relaying them. So it's, it's almost like somebody passing notes <laughs> in, in a meeting or in a classroom. Uh, so as opposed to the participants being able to align with each other or converge with each other um, or accommodate to each other, the interpreter becomes the, the, the post office, if you will, for which all communication has to go through. So instead of a continuous interaction, which is what the participants mostly want and mostly what's happening in, in dialogue interpreting, you know, where, whether it's interviews or the group discussions or whatever, instead of continuous interaction, we have these series of one-way interactions, these one-way monologues that are mediated by the interpreter that are very stilted and they feel really unnatural to both deaf and hearing people because they don't follow 
the kind of normal expected rules of interaction that we talked about. So the series of turns, again, is counter to the expected nature of interaction. So by the, the, the ideas that we talked about earlier, it's, it feels non-cooperative to the participants. It feels non-accommodating, where they can't really relate directly to each other, and it feels non-aligning. So therefore, it, it feels unnatural. Um, and that's one of the problems of this interpreter as, you know, communication cop in the middle, if you will. Okay. Now, in the literature, again, there have been alternatives, um, and as mentioned earlier, Cecilia Vodenshow back in, the, in um, 1998 in her, her seminal work, uh, Interpreting as Interaction, talking about the fact that interpreters are a crucial part of the interactions. They are not machines. They're not bolt-ons. They're actually a part of that. Um, Cynthia Roy, um, if, if you haven't read this, it's a lovely, lovely piece of work. Interpreting as a discourse process. Uh, it, the the latest edition, or well, the last edition, was 2000, but Cynthia's work goes back to um, her dissertation in 1989, I believe, her PhD. Um, and what actually Peter and I have done in our book is we've actually reanalyzed her data with her approval um, in light of this role space that we're going to talk about. So she talked about this interaction. Um, it's fascinating. It's a it's a deaf postgraduate student, an interpreter, and a hearing professor. Um, and not only did she record and analyze the interaction, she also talked to each of the participants afterward about what they were doing and why they were doing it. It's one of the first really beautiful examples we have of that. And and. Cynthia was generous enough to, to let us reanalyze our data in light of our model to say, oh, here's how, how we would describe that. Um, and the, the, one of the other areas, or other people that um, is not known, but I'm trying to tout, is a woman named um, Danielle Claude Belanger from Montreal uh, from a 2004 paper in the Journal of Interpreting, um, where she talked about um, the idea that not only is meaning co-constructed. So we talked about this idea of psycholinguistic um, um, alignment where everyone can kind of constructs the meaning. Meaning is constructed by the participants, but the interaction itself is also mutually constructed. And this diagram that you see is actually from the, the article where, again, you saw me kind of do a triangle. She does a triangle in a different way where the participants are kind of at the end of these little lines and the interaction is co- uh, or mutually constructed by the, the, the communication partners and the interpreter. And that's a, I think, a crucial uh, sea change away from what we're talking about. Um, we can't pretend we're not there. Um, a great um, researcher and interpreter from the States, Gary Sanderson, talked about what he called the quote unquote sore thumb <laughs> model of interpreting. We stick out like a sore thumb, and the more we pretend we're not there, the more weird it feels. So, um, big long winded introduction. Apologize for that. It's probably very boring for some of you, um, but here's what when Ben Peter and I really started to to come to ideas. Here's what we said, and um, I'll read this out so you don't have to read if you won't want to. Um, what we said in a paper back in 2009 uh, for uh, a supporting deaf people online conference was there cannot be one right approach to all interactions, and I think that's what happens with a lot of the, the way codes are written. To talk of stepping out of role is to miss the point, as I mentioned before. Interpreters are human beings with specialist communication skills, and one can't step out of being a human being. Is it possible that the notion of role is simply a construct that interpreters have hidden behind to avoid their individual responsibility for professional decision making? And we said, if there are no clear rules to follow, what is there to regulate an interpreter's behavior? Because, again, Peter and I are not saying it's a free-for-all. Well, what ensures that an interpreter would act professionally? And the answer that we would suggest, and we started to suggest, is this is integrity as the first step. So what we came up with was, oops, excuse me, um, how can the role, concept of role be modeled to reflect what actually hap happens in successful interactions or avoid what we know happens in unsuccessful interactions? Um, and again, going back to this guy, Ralph Turner, in the 50s, since roles are not something that we have, we don't own them, we don't put them on, we don't wear them like coats, we don't wear them like hats, they are something that we enact, they're something we do, we pr propose this concept of role space. And it's um, dynamic, it's situational, and probably, I think for me, most crucially, it's negotiable between and amongst all the participants. So we finally get to the, <laughs> the title of the webinar. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about the, the, the three parts of the model, give you some graphic examples, and then um, talk about some implications, and then let you guys 
chime in uh, if you're all still there. So what we come up with is this, this, this three-dimensional idea. So if you think about a 3D axis with an X, Y, and Z thing, and I'll show you a picture in a second, that there are three uh, dimensions along which we make decisions as interpreters um, that, that create the role that we enact. The first is, and this again is related to Goffman, is the axis of presentation of self. So how much we present ourselves as, like for myself when I'm interpreting, as Robert, as opposed to being as Robert as the author of communication, for example, as opposed to just the animator of another person's communication. Um, the second, and again you'll see these visually, is the axis of what we call interlocutor or participant alignment, how much we identify with. And by identify, we don't mean how much we like them. So it's not that I like the deaf people more than the hearing people, or I like the hearing people more than the deaf people, but how much are we reacting to them, how much are we relating to them, how much are we even perceived of being um, aligned with them. Again, not in a, in a, in a way that we're compromising um, this vague concept of impartiality, um, but in terms of how much we're actually doing things, and I'll give you some examples. And the, the third one, which is probably the least controversial, to be honest, um, is what we call interaction management, which I think is, on, again, as I gave some examples, that even, even very strict machine model um, rules would say that we're allowed to manage the interaction, like if we don't understand something or we need repetition, etc. Um, and we can talk about about whether we covertly do that, meaning kind of in a hidden way, or overtly do that. So, this is the kind of 3D schema that we've come in, and I, I guess you can see, um, Victoria will tell me if you can't, you can see if I use my pointer, yeah? I hope, because um, <laughs> I, I am sharing the screen, it's very kind of weird. Um, so, um, so the axis of, let's talk with the, the, the least controversial, the axis of interaction management is the vertical one. Um, so, and I'll go through these kind of individually. So high interaction management, where I'm doing a lot to manage the interaction, turn taking, et cetera, as opposed to low. Um, participant alignment, and I've, I've arbitrarily put hearing on one side and deaf on the other. By the way, this model is agnostic when it comes to deaf versus hearing. It could be Spanish speakers, French speakers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the presentation of self, and, and by the way, I'm terrible with graphics, and you're lucky you're getting this, because <laughs> I am really terrible. Someday I want this to be actual 3D, and I'm working with some, some graphic people to hopefully make this happen. If you think about this, this Z axis as the axis of presentation of self is kind of forward, so the higher presentation of self is the more I'm outwardly presenting who I am. Like, for example, if I'm interpreting, I'd say, excuse me, I really didn't understand that. Can you repeat that? Um, as opposed to this end, which is a very negative presentation of self where I don't respond to questions, etc. Okay, so I'll go through each of the axes and hopefully, and then give you some examples and hopefully it'll make sense. All right, so, whoops, there we go. So, presentation of self, again, high presentation of self, um, again, in Goffman's term is the interpreter as author. Um, example of introducing oneself, speaking for oneself, you know, hello, my name is Robert. Um, if any of you have ever, if you're interpreters and you've worked in situations where um, you're not just the interpreter, you might also be an employee, and so you might be interpreting an interaction where someone says, oh, we're going to have this meeting um, a week from Thursday, and it should be fine, and you might say, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, you might remember that I'm not working Thursday, you will have to get another interpreter. Okay, That's an example of high presentation of self. I'm authoring the statement, Okay, I'm animating, I'm authoring, I'm talking as myself. Um, and again, all of these um, decisions are uh, going to be based uh, upon the situation and the negotiation. The other side, um, low presentation of self, again, instead of saying I or, you know, referring to myself in first person, talking, referring to myself as the interpreter, you know, the interpreter would like a break, um, the interpreter doesn't understand. Um, if you think about it, it's kind of odd because, you know, I've, I've, I have a lot of different, again, sociologically speaking roles. So, for example, when I'm lecturing, like I am now, <laughs> or talking, um, when I lecture in a classroom to students, if I misspeak, I don't say, oh, lecturer error, I meant to say this. I say, I'm sorry, I meant to say this. Okay, so the whole idea of referring to oneself as our job is a little weird. Um, when we are told or we believe we can't respond to direct questions. So the hearing person asks me, how long have you been signing? And I just ignore them. Again, contrary to that whole idea of cooperative principle. 
um, waiting for other people to introduce us, that's a very low presentation of self. Now that's not necessarily negative, so some situations, for example, court situations, require us to have an incredibly low presentation of self. Um, and that's not necessarily wrong, but if that's our only starting point, um, or the only way that we actually think that we can interact, um, that's problematic, because there are many situations where that's not appropriate. Um, and there's, uh, for those of you who know any psychology, there's um, Abraham Maslow had a great quote. <laughs> he said, um, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So if I'm only told I can't interact, the only thing I do is just not interact. And again, that's incredibly non-cooperative, non-aligning, and then ultimately detrimental to the, the, perce the perception of the deaf person. So that's the presentation of self. Again, interaction management. Um, probably the least controversial part of the model. Those behaviors that we use to manage how the interaction is proceeding. Um, high management would be regulating turn-taking, um, interpreting consecutively. So if you decide, for example, again, I said I used to do a lot of medical interpreting. If it's an initial um, appointment and a deaf person's giving their medical history, I might choose to interpret consecutively because I know it's going to be more accurate because I'm going to get a lot more information. That's a very high level of management. Um, any of you who have ever done uh, telephone interpreting, there's um, a huge, because the whole channel, the visual channel is missing, there's a huge amount of management that has to happen in order for it to hopefully happen successfully. Uh, the other end of the scale, low management would be exercising no control. The booth interpreting refers to spoken language conference interpreting, where the speaker will be on the stage, the interpreters will actually be in a booth often behind the audience, there's no way for them to stop the speaker or interact in any way, okay? So the situation itself forces zero management. Um, and VRS stands for Video Relay Service, which doesn't happen as much in this country, but in the states where um, it's the sign language equivalent of type talk, where the, even though it's done by interpreters, the, the rules of interaction are that you are not allowed to ask for clarification, you're not allowed to, um, you're just supposed to interpret what you see even if you don't understand, which is problematic. And I'll leave it at that. Um, then the third axis, the horizontal axis, again, the axis of participant alignment or interlocutor alignment, depending on the, how fancy you want your words to be, uh, how much the interpreter is either directing their communication to or seeming to identify with a specific participant. Again, if we're talking one deaf, one hearing, or the hearing people and the deaf people. Or it might be that the interpreter is reacting directly to utterances made by one of the interlocutors. And I'll give you an example. So um, again, we talked about sociolinguistic alignment that affect the social distance and psycholinguistic behaviors that contribute to the shared meaning. So again, um, I'm interpreting for um, a, a lovely old deaf lady who's um, at her doctor's and the doctor says, oh, how's, how's everything been going? And she, she gets a little upset and she says, oh, my cat who I had for 15 years died. Now, for me to just interpret that with a very flat face is very difficult. And especially if I have some relationship or this poor old woman's cat died, I might actually react a little bit, even though that seems to be a violation of everything we were all told. Um, so before I even voice it, I might sign something like, I'm sorry, and give her, you know, a, a, a face that shows some empathy. That's a way of aligning, okay? So the fact we can align um, with various, at various times with both the deaf and hearing people. Um, and it might be the same thing that, um, for example, the deaf person is signing and the hearing person says, um, I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? And I might say, did you not understand me or not understand, did you not understand what I said or the content? So I might be aligning with the hearing person that way. Okay, so the idea that we, um, and I should have said this earlier, all these decision points happen and they're dynamic. It changes over time. So the whole idea of quote unquote role space, it, it's very different from the beginning of an interaction um, all the way through. So if you imagine us kind of sliding along these, these various um, axes, um, interacting, you know, doing high interaction management at one point, low in another, aligning with the deaf and hearing people. Um, again, in, when we re-examine Cynthia Roy's data, um, and again, if, if, you, if you see it in the book, the, the interpreter is amazing because within the space of three seconds, he aligns with both the hearing person and the deaf person incredibly successfully. Okay? Um, so the idea, it's not that something that we just do, we just align all the time with the hearing person or the deaf person, but it's this dynamic, um, fluid movement.
Right. So, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I've been really bad with turning my pages. So, oh yes. So, some situational examples, um, and then um, I. I I have some implications and conclusions, but I think given the time, we might turn it over to you guys for questions. Um, one just quick example is there was um, a student of, of Peter's at um, uh, Leeds, who also whose surname was Leeds, Rebecca Leeds, who did an interesting um, uh, study for her MA looking at the perception of interpreters, qualified interpreters who were working in doctor surgeries in Cardiff. Um, and she did a survey only for doctor surgeries that were hiring professional um, uh, qualified interpreters. So she, she pinpointed those surgeries that, that she knew what they were doing. And she asked them a bunch of questions. But amongst the questions, the specific question was, um, you know, do you have deaf people who use British Sign Language or Sign Language? Yes or no? Of course, they would say yes, because she picked them. <laughs> um, and then she said, um, who do you think these people are? You know, who, what is their relation? Again, these are all qualified interpreters. Um, probably all wearing their badges when they were there, et cetera, et cetera. And she had a checklist of things like um, professional interpreter, um, carer, uh, family member, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a, a huge majority of the response was that everything but interpreter. So even when there were professional interpreters who, again, I'm not, I am not and nor is she judging the, the professional behavior of these interpreters, um, the perception was they weren't interpreters. <laughs> they were actually perceived as being aligned with the deaf person in some way, most likely as either a family member, if that was made sense, or as a carer. Okay, so even when we think we're <laughs> we're being perceived in one way, we just have to realize that perceptions, just like this idea of being perceived as an auditor, um, is something that's that's often invisible to us. So the exact the I want to just give you one. Um, example over time, um, specifically for my own practice, because again, I was a medical interpreter for a long time. Um, and I think, um, again, any of you who do um, kind of ongoing work, will this might resonate with. But I think it's a good example of, um, again, the, the, I'm going to show you some static pictures, remembering that the, the role space is going to be dynamic in each of them, but um, imagining over time how this changes. Um, whoops, sorry. So for example, um, the, the example I'll use, and I did a lot of this, where I was working with um, the same deaf person who was going in for a chronic illness. And the example I usually use is something like diabetes. So someone who's initially um, found to be diabetic um, and then is referred to a consultant or to a diabetes clinic. So they've gone to their GP. Um, however that, that you know went, they're now being um, seen by a consultant or a diabetes clinic. So if you you see on the chart here, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> didn't want to show you. Um, so the initial medical history. So it's the first time the person's going to the consultant or the clinic. And if you notice, the uh, I put interaction management as high because <laughs> obviously, um, in in all situations, the, the the content and the quality of the communication is important. But the in Initial medical history is really important. Um, a physician I worked with for many years in 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 the U.S. who was a huge huge proponent of working with both spoken and sign language interpreters, who was also multilingual, he said, "Look, 80% of my diagnosis is based on what the patient tells me. 20% is the fancy tests. And if I get the communication wrong, the patient's going to suffer. So interaction management might even be a little higher than that." It's, so I'm really really making sure that if I don't understand or I need to clarify, I'm going to do that. Um, my presentation of self, as you can see, is probably very, very low because what I one of the things I the goal I think is that important both for the consultant and, and the deaf person or the clinician and the deaf person is that they need to have a rapport. And what I didn't say before, what you need to think about, if I need for them to to have a successful interaction, and sometimes that means me getting out of the way. Um, and my alignment, as you can see here, is somewhat equal, but probably a little bit more with the patient because I want to make sure that they feel comfortable enough that I am their uh, quote unquote voice that they feel confident that that's going on hopefully the, the physician <laughs> will also think so um, but I want to make sure that that's comfortable so again minimal presentation of self high level of interactive management because of the, the, the necessity of the clarity of the communication and really getting out of the way and hoping that these two can kind of interact in a way that's positive. Um, so as with, as with many chronic um, illnesses, there'll be follow-up appointments. So 
after maybe a series of tests, there's another follow-up appointment. Again, the interaction management very high. There might be slightly more presentation of self because, again, I've seen these people before. Whether I've, you know, and so it's very difficult to have a continuous negative presentation of self with people you see on a regular basis. Um, however, um, and again, I'm still probably aligning with the patient. Now, I've worked where I've followed um, patients with a variety of different chronic illnesses, um, from HIV to cancer to diabetes um, to multiple sclerosis, CP, etc. And depending on how long you spend with the person, um, you get these further ongoing treatments. Now, notice the interaction management really doesn't change. However, the the alignment is probably going to be even more with the patient than the doctor. You're going to kind of kind of spread because we know each other fairly well, and also the presentation of self is going to be pretty high. So what happens is, um, and one of the views in in many quarters in the states and a lot of places that interpreters, spoken or signed, are considered a part of the treatment team with very specialist, situ you know, specialist skills. We don't, we don't diagnose, we don't prescribe, obviously, but we are very specifically um, there to do that. And because of that, that presentation of self helps to um, establish the trust, um, allow the alignment um, to happen. And again, if you think back to that triangular idea, if, if the patient and the clinician can't converge and align with me, there's no way they're going to align with each other. And I think that's crucially probably the point. So um, I just have a couple more things to say and then want you guys to say some questions. Um, I'm just going to, again, you'll be able to read this and, and think about this. I just want to throw some ideas of implications. I hope, again, it's very rushed, but I've given you at least a sense of this idea of these three axes of interaction um, and how, you know, that's space that we take up, and, and I, I, it's metaphorical and sometimes physical. How much space we take up in interaction is, is, um, is what we're talking about. So some implications. Um, obviously, I teach interpreters, um, and I think one of the things that in the past, and many of you have heard about this, we, we talk about things like um, social skills and emotional intelligence as, 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 in inverted commas, soft skills. I don't think they're soft skills. I think they're very hard skills um, in, in many ways. And I think I, one of the things I'm looking for with, with potential students is because a lot of the, the interpreting um, that we end up doing crucially involves interaction, not just one-way interpreting. I think it's vital that people have the ability to know how they align um, and how they accommodate to each other and how they present themselves. And that's something that I'm, I'm looking for more and more in students. Um, in spoken language interpreting, they have the option of putting somebody in a booth and they never have to interact. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important that we have people who who can comfortably go into situations and not, and you know, we always leave a footprint, but it should be the, the least footprint that we do. Um, some other, for team interpreting or co-working, um, one of the things that when we developed this model that became, that helped me so much in my 25 plus years of practice is it helped explain why there's some interpreters, colleagues who are also friends that I can't work with very successfully. And they might be better quote unquote interpreters than I am in terms of the linguistic skill or vice versa, but we have very different ideas about what role space should be. Sometimes I think they are taking a space that's bigger than I think it should be or vice versa. And I think that's, interesting and I think also deaf and hearing people perceive that even if it's not uh, so the language might be understood but the how, how we negotiate and feel into the interaction and when I presented this in a variety of places deaf and hearing people have said ah this helps explain like the fact that oh yeah I understood that person but I, they, I just don't feel comfortable with them in our situation um, just some other examples specialized settings so any of you have worked with children <laughs> um, let me just go back here a little bit um, oops, sorry. Um, this whole idea of um, presentation of self to try—I dare you, I defy you—to <laughs> interact and, and interpret in situations involving children and have a low presentation of self. It ain't gonna work. <laughs> the kids aren't gonna get it. Talking about yourself as interpreter, they're just gonna laugh at you. Um, so the idea that specialized settings um, might require us to do have different role spaces than um, than we might think. Um, also for mental health uh, settings, for medical settings, example for birth, um, we have very different senses of, of what the space should be. Um, designated interpreting, for those familiar, you know, this is where we work with the same deaf person uh, over a period of time. 
Uh, I've done that myself. Uh, I just found out literally today, my email, that there's a presentation at the EFSLE conference coming up by Hilda Haldeland, who's um, Norwegian, talking uh, using the world space model, which I'm very happy about, with her um, colleague, who's her interpreter, who worked with her through her entire PhD, and talking about the how, how as designated interpreter, the space that we negotiate with deaf people is, is crucially and, and radically different than, for example, a one-off situation. Um, again, um, technology, the increased use of, of VRS, video relay service, but VRI, video remote interpreting. Um, again, sorry to plug the book, but one of the chapters that we, we talk about is the fact that the, the Im influence of the screen is huge, that people really find it hard to align with anybody else when they're looking at a screen. Um, so even though we used to talk about the fact that we needed to have really clear HD video and, and the audio had to be synchronized, we have all that now. That's almost, it's pretty trivial. We can do it on our phones. But even if you think about it, hearing people still get together in the same room for, for a reason. So I think that's um, the, the impact of technology should not be ignored. Um, and one of the things we explore in the book is that we, we if there are situations where the alignment and the accommodation is crucially important, then technology might not be the best way to go. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that um, codes of practice and codes of conduct, there was a recent review of our book <coughs> in the journal Interpreting, and one of the things that was noted by the reviewer was that oftentimes codes of practice, conduct, ethics, whatever you want to call them, depending on the country and the association you're with, um, don't reflect actual practice. Uh, and one of the things that's problematic is that what we're trying to do is actually reflect what we know about actual practice and have that reflected in the code. Um, some of the work that we've done, again, as mentioned in some of the articles we've written, is that if you actually plot the role space of most codes, they don't coincide to any actual genuine situation where interpreters ever are, which calls into question the accuracy of those codes and the applicability of those codes. So, whew! <laughs> um, sorry for the long-winded way of going. Um, there's a whole series of references here, which again, you'll get. Um, we go back to that. And um, I'm more than happy to um, take questions. So um, thanks, everybody, whoever's out there. Um, so um, do, 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 do. first question is, how does stepping out of role fit with the Dean and Pollard practice professional model? Well, um, I mean, Pete and I would agree that we are a practice profession, um, and again, the we don't think the the construct of role makes any sense in um, where you can talk about stepping out of role. Um, one of the things that that Dean and Pollard talk about is conservative versus liberal decisions. Um, there's actually an article, and I meant to put the slide on here, and of course I didn't. Um, there was an article in the, the RID, the American Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf Views, which is their kind of newsletter, the equivalent of Newsly uh, for the ASLI folks, um, where a guy named Doug Bowen Bailey actually plotted, and if I can go back, do, 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 I can look at this, it's amazing, um, where um, Dean and Pollard talk about conservative versus liberal decisions, so making you know, very limited decisions are conservative, very broad decisions are liberal. Um, and what Doug talked about is that, you know, being, um, having a high interaction management is very liberal, having a low interaction management is very conservative in Dean and Pollard's sense. Um, presentation of self, um, again, high presentation of self would be very uh, liberal, low would be very conservative. But the interesting thing is if you map the liberal conservative, kind of being in the middle and not aligning with anybody is very conservative. <laughs> and aligning with either side is liberal. So that's one of the ways it sort of, it does do kind of dovetail. And um, again, it, it's the last summer, I believe, uh, edition of the RID Views, which I do have a PDF, which I might be able to get to Victoria to send out to people if she asks me again when I remember. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. BRS interpreting and a high degree of management with both the interlocutors and will chat comfortably. Um, oh, well, the reason I say it's low management, um, and I'd be curious to see where you do VRS in this in in some places in the states because it's 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 mushroomed in the states. Um, when we presented this in in various incarnations, we've been told that there are some VRS companies that do not allow things like chat comfortably with both and interaction management, where they're actually told you are not allowed to do that. Um, and even when, you know, 
you the screen comes up and it's a deaf person who knows you and says hi how are you and you just say what the company what some of these companies will say is you you only respond with your number you don't respond with your name you don't interact as if you know the person um, so what I'll say is there's some flavors of VRS that don't allow that type of um, of flexibility and um, and again that's that's incredibly interesting because VRS is supposed to, you know, in the states, part of the reason it, it's 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 governed by the rules of the Federal Communications Commission, more like again the equivalent of Type Talk. Uh, so some companies have read that very very strictly and said, no no no, even though you're an interpreter, you're not really interpreting, you're just relaying. Um, so that's why I said in you know some flavors of VRS and certain to clarify. Thanks for asking the question, um, where that's not allowed, nor is presentation itself. So I hope that helps. And again, I'm sorry, just I'm making a distinction between VRS, which is telephone relay, the equivalent of type talk, and VRI, which is remote interpreting, where it's just the technology where people happen to be in a different place. Uh, next question. I'm going to read this, so there'll be a little bit of silence So I, um, while well, I process this. So the, the question is, and I'll, I'll read most of it, uh, would you agree that alignment can sometimes be misinterpreted as inappropriate allegiance? This can be in any direction but present difficulties, for example, in a courtroom. On the other hand, to be aware of this and make an effort not to align can be perceived as being stiff by the deaf person or aloof by a hearing person. Yes, and I think that's why it's, it's, it is tricky. Um, one of, the, one of the, the extreme examples, again, is, again, a medical example. Sometimes we'll feel very comfortable chatting with the deaf person. Again, this is some schools of interpreting, not everybody. Not in, I'm sure nobody listening. <laughs> um, where we, we very comfortably chat with the deaf person as we walk into the doctor's office, and then as soon as we start doing, the doctor talks to the interpreter, and the interpreter ignores them. And that is seen as being aloof. Um, sometimes, and again, I, I wasn't able to go into to, to a lot of um, detail on it, but how we how we how we are perceived in ways that are respectful to both sides of the equation. Um, so, for example, um, you know, chatting with a deaf person when I worked in a hospital, saying, "Look, I know the doctor very well. I've interpreted for them a lot of times." They're like, "Oh, that's really nice." So, walking in, me just shaking hands and saying hello to the doctor, that quick bit of alignment is is perfectly fine. Um, and then sometimes if I need to clarify something with a deaf person, that perception of alignment is understood because that's it. And I, and I think it's making sure that people know why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I, I, I agree that it can sometimes be misinterpreted as, as allegiance um, or, you know, um, favoring people. Um, but sometimes the alignment might be very subtle. It might be that um, I'm interpreting what the hearing person's saying, but they're not being very clear. <laughs> and some way of aligning with the deaf person, I'm saying, they, I, this is what they're saying. Do you want me to do something about this? <laughs> do you want to ask them or should I? Um, and that's, that's another form of alignment where it, it is part of interaction management. And again, these, these axes are not um, separate. But there is, there is a part of that where, um, but we want to make sure that we're not perceived as aligning in ways that are inappropriate. And I think you're right. Hope that answers the question. So someone said there may be situations where we're asked direct questions. We would judge an unsituational appropriate. If the deaf person may view it differently and answer for us, or say you don't have to answer that. Right. And what I and what I what I say to the deaf person is. You have to understand what the consequences are, because again, if we're if we're assuming that we're supposed to be as interpreters bilingual and bicultural, I might say, look, if I don't answer this hearing person, they're going to think I'm rude, and therefore they're not going to trust you. If I answer very quickly and move on, they're going to be fine. What do you, you know? If you want if you want to be perceived or want me to be perceived as rude, and therefore you be perceived as rude, those are the consequences. And I think that's one of the, the important um, tasks that we have as interpreters is to open that up. Um, or to just say, look, I can't answer. I'm I'm busy working right now, um, and just acknowledge that. Um, and because I, I think that, um, you know, and I understand why we have this pendulum swing to to being, you know, trying to to not present ourselves where deaf people but didn't want to feel quote unquote in American terms disempowered. However, the other response is very disempowering and potentially negative consequences for the deaf person as well. Hello. Oh, Robin. Hi, Robin. 
okay, was it, oh, okay, this is very long. I'm going to have to, <laughs> I'm going to have to summarize. Sorry, um, or I will read some of it. Um, right. Um, so the devices and terms used from sociology are different than how we talk about decisions in ethics and professional ethics. As two examples, um, perhaps you can step out of a role in a sociological sense, but you can step out of a role from a professional ethics perspective. Similarly, in a sociological sense, you say that you occupy a role and do not have a role. In professional ethics, it's the opposite. You have a role, you don't occupy one. Um, there are not many people in our field who come from the field of professional ethics but are strongly influenced by sociology. As a deviation from describing behavior, you talk about successful interpreting interaction. Can you explain to us in what ways in which you are defining success, aligning successfully with deaf and hearing people, and how that is similar or different from a professional ethicist might evaluate decisions? Um, would they be the same? Well, my, the definition of successful interaction for us is um, are these two people able to get their communication goals achieved, whatever those happen to be, whether it's that they end up um, signing a contract, they end up having a, a knockdown, drag them out fight <laughs> and never talk to each other again, but they did say, you know, they do that clearly understanding each other. Um, you know, th those, all those types of success are, um, are, are equally valid because it depends on what the, the goals of the, of the interactants are. Um, and I, what I guess in terms of, um, I, I still I, ha, I feel very strongly that people use this stepping out of role to to explain behaviors that are still intuitively appropriate, um, but potentially against what a, how a, how a um, a very descriptive code uh, or a very prescriptive code might actually um, require them to to interact. And so I think in terms of um, what the behaviors that people are enacting um, in order to show that they're they're performing this this social role, um, and again, I don't think having the role is really helpful because, in terms of from this 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 the the the, the model of this role, because that when no matter what the interpreter does, whether it's ethical or not, whether it's even legal or not, they are still doing it in the guise of an interpreter, and the reason that that you know, we can call people to question just, just the same as with doctors. Uh, I mean, a doctor can't say, oh, I stepped out of role and I, you know, physically assaulted the patient, so you can't get me on, <laughs> on that because I wasn't in my doctor role at the time. Um, I think that's, that's the, the key point, and I think what we're trying to, to highlight is that this use of stepping out of role and, and, and as opposed to understanding what those behaviors are, how we align, in what ways we align that are appropriate, what ways we present ourselves, and what ways we interact um, and, and manage the interaction. Those are the the, the ways that we're that we're actually enacting this role, um, and maybe inappropriately, but you, at least as a principled way that piece, that people can be called on and said, okay, that was way too much presentation of self when you decided to give, you know, all this advice or a prescription to a deaf person. But at least it's being done in a you know in a constrained way. And I don't know if that answered your question or not. <laughs> Uh, the next thing is, I said, we always leave a footprint. It seems you're saying that the bigger the footprint, the less appropriate the behavior. Have I understood your point? No, I think we just need to leave the right size footprint. It shouldn't be too big or too small. Um, so if if I'm in a situation where um, the the participants, the deaf and hearing participants, have known each other really, really well, um, it might be that for the most part, I'm getting out of the way. That the only two these things, the uh, only thing these two people do not share is a language. Um, and that might be I leave a really tiny footprint <laughs> because I don't have to do a lot because they're very familiar with each other and they have a lot of background. Um, sometimes I need to leave a big footprint. It might be that um, they're having a hard time understanding each other. I'm having a hard time understanding them, and so my footprint might be bigger. So it's not that bigger is worse and smaller is better. It's leaving the uh, you know, again, in, in, instead of doing things like good and bad, I think talking about optimal. You know, for this situation with these interactants and these participants, and with myself as the interpreter, you know, what's the optimal um, interaction alignment and management that I can do um, in order to allow them to have a successful interaction as opposed to impeding them from having a successful interaction. But we, we're always going to be there. We can't, we can't pretend we're not there because even, even in a very constrained situation like a very formal courtroom, um, it's still, for example, my voice um, at times or my signs at times. So it, I'm, we are still present there. Um, and again, how, how, how big that presence is in terms of the metaphor of footprint um, is contingent upon all those, all those factors if that makes sense.
That says someone with a, with big feet, by the way. Uh, question: uh, Would you recommend trainee interpreters plotting their role space ahead of assignments as part of their preparation, or indeed qualified interpreters? Well, one of the things I I thank you for asking that. I didn't say one one of the things that Peter and I have both found helpful with, with this um, is. Yes, I think I think the model can be used kind of proscriptive, you know, um, before an assignment in terms of preparation. And say, based what I know about this situation, I can kind of anticipate. Here's what I expect. Now, that's a hypothesis, just like all of our preparation, because we might prepare in a certain way and go in and find out things are totally different. Um, however, using you know what I can under, you know based on what I know about these people I'm going to assume that they have a certain alignment with each other I'm, I might present myself in a certain way if I'm going into for example I'm a male interpreter going into a prim, prim, predominantly female environment I might make some assumptions about how I present myself how I might manage the interaction um, also if I'm again co-working or teaming talking about what we think might be um, the shared space that we're going to be, be uh, doing or sharing the space and also in terms of evaluation like how did that really go did that so um, I'll just give you a quick example I interpreted a, I was hired to do uh, interpret for a deaf person um, an ASO user in another country English was the was the spoken language uh, um, and I had, it was going to be an eight-day seminar, and I had a sense of what I thought the interaction was going to be because we're going to be together. And when I showed up at the registration table and met the person, um, we got through the registration, and the person said to me, okay, the first session is in two hours. See you then. And I went, oh, okay. And that was a signal of, okay, she doesn't want much presentation of self, <laughs> so I'm going to pull back. So when I showed up two hours later to, to set up the, the initial um, uh, first session, um, I, I, I was very kind of circumspect, you know, said everything, I just sat there, and then the person said, oh, where are you from? I went, ah, okay, she wants a little bit more. So I started with kind of my hypothesis of where my starting point was, and then taking the cues from the people and the persons, both at this point the deaf person, but later the hearing people, about how much they wanted, which is why we say this is negotiable. So I think, yeah, I think it could be used as a, as a way to kind of predict what I might do in a situation. Or if I'm going into a situation where I'm a new interpreter, I, I might be experienced, but I've never interpreted this interaction before, talking to other interpreters who've interpreted the same or similar interactions and saying, what, what clues can you give me to give me at least a starting point? So I don't go in with a blank slate. I go in at least with some sense of a schema. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello. Some old school deaf professionals aren't keen to allow the interpreter to introduce themselves. This puts the hearing person and the interpreter on the back foot, and it's hard to repair to pull the interaction back to normalize it. Yep. Um, again, I think talking to people about what the um, implications and the consequences are of the behaviors that they think they want. I, I went back to um, where I used to work in Boston, and I was presenting some of this to some um, friends and colleagues, uh, some of whom worked in uh, what we call vocational rehabilitation, getting deaf people either back to work or into work. And there was a very good, very dedicated team of deaf professionals and interpreters, and one of the things they spent, they realized they spent too much time on was for the deaf people going to seek employment, they spent a lot of time helping them practice how to introduce the interpreter. So much so that the deaf people got really stressed about it, where they were so focused on introducing the interpreter, which is the first thing they had to do, they forgot about their CV and introducing themselves. And, and my take is, if the deaf person and hearing person already know each other, right, and I'm the new person uh, in the interaction, having the deaf person go, oh, hello, you know, Tom, this is Robert, he's going to be interpreting, that totally makes sense to me, because they already have... A, a relationship, and the and the hearing person is familiar with working with the deaf person with an interpreter. That's not going to be weird to them. My problem is if the deaf person and the hearing person have never met. Hearing person's fairly naive, hasn't worked with a deaf person or interpreter, and the first interaction is automatically interpreted, and the deaf the hearing person has to sit there and go, "All right, you're talking, but you're talking as her." That introduction doesn't work. You know, so in terms of kind of just sociolinguistics, the purpose of an introduction is for people to present who they are and their names. We've already set up a situation where the hearing person has to do this mental gymnastics, and it's way uncomfortable, and they feel de-skilled. As opposed to me just, you know, you know, very quickly, I'm Robert, I'll be interpreting, and as soon as that's fine, okay, they've acknowledged me as a human being, turning, and then, hello, and I'm so-and-so, and I'm going to be here for the meeting. You know, and I think 
um, talking about the consequences because I've been I'm a, you know I've been doing this a long time I'm pretty savvy of using of interpreting services it's really awkward even on the phone when I have a deaf colleague and friend who calls me and saying hi this is so and so talking through an interpreter I'm like really seriously <laughs> as opposed to the interpreter going hi Robert it's so and so I'm here with blah 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 that makes that's more normal and if it, if it makes me feel weird and I'm used to it, imagine you know how how naive people feel. I think it's and I understand the point of wanting to you know deaf people to feel empowered to do that. But I think also being arbiters of the other cultures say Look, here in terms of mainstream culture, it's going to feel really weird. And if that if if you want person people to feel weird, okay, I'm your guy. But you need to know what the conse the specific consequences are um, of of what you're asking. Okay, because otherwise. You know, don't blame me if it if, if it feels really strange for the first ten minutes, <laughs> because I I told you so. I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. So um, thanks everybody, um, and I think it's going back to Victoria. I'll just leave up. And thank you to everybody, by the way. I want to thank whoever you are out there. And it's very weird out in TV land or in radio land. Um, I really appreciate um, your time and attention and taking your time out to listen to me blather on. And thanks to Victoria and Herb Tree as well. Thank you so much, Robert. Just to check, can everyone hear me OK? Um, we do have one more question that I'm going to um, give verbally to save typing it all out and waiting for Robert to get that. So um, can you comment on telephone interpreting with a male deaf person and a female interpreter? Uh, yes. Oh, gee. Um, yeah. Uh, again, the, the, the first thing for me is who is, you know, what is this? A, is this call uh, to someone familiar or not? Uh, if it's someone who's not familiar, just again, from for me talking to the deaf person, say, look, as a hearing person on the phone, I have to make certain assumptions, and I'm I'm just assuming I'm talking to one person, and and that often has to be unpacked. So the whole idea of saying, you know, people say, I, I don't want you to say, you know, you're talking for me or interpreting for me, but that's what's happening. Um, so, you know, when I finally get the person, it's often getting to the right person, with we you know with the way switchboards are and stupid dialing menus, um, where you're saying, you know. Hi, um, and I'll, I will use my name because people say, "Well, don't use your name." Well, that's really weird because if we don't, you know, hi, this is an interpreter. That just sounds very odd. Say, my name is Robert. I'm interpreting for you know Sally Smith. Uh, she's deaf, and um, you know what you hear is is me interpreting her into English, and I'll interpret everything into sign language for you. Um, and if you have any questions about that, let me know. I mean, I think it's just it's just helping people because there's no visual channel, giving them a, enough of a mental picture uh, and framing that. And again, I, I worked with deaf people years ago who said, well, I don't want you to say, you know, that it's an interpreter. And one of the things that I've talked, and Pete and I have talked about this with, actually, in some ways, that's also fraud. <laughs> you know, if I pretend to be somebody I'm not, that's potentially fraudulent. They said, well, I don't want, you know, deaf people say, well, I, I don't want them to know it's an interpreter. Well, in certain cases, that might be fraudulent, and that's that's not that's not trivial. Um, and it's actually happened in certain in cases where an, an interpreter was forced to present themselves as somebody else, and that's that's fraudulent, and I think that's incredibly problematic. Um, and I think just, just unpacking it and, and explaining what it is and, and talking to the deaf person about, look, if I don't explain this, the hearing person is going to be very confused. Your point to call them is not to confuse them. Your point is to talk about whatever your phone call is about. And here, here's what I know about hearing people on the phone and hearing etiquette on the phone and hearing protocol that can help minimize all that stuff so you can get your questions asked and, and you can get on with your life. So I don't know if that helps. Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you so much for answering that last question for us, Robert. And thank you for um, answering all of the fantastic questions we've had this evening. Um, numbers of long ones, as I promised earlier, Robert, when we were preparing. Um, that's interpreters for you, which is absolutely amazing, really. Um, in terms of um, feedback, um, I'd just like to share some feedback live with you as we've been getting it. Um, 
just to go to um, a, feedback, a piece of feedback that I really liked is thank you for the freedom to be normal, um, which I think is highly relevant because I think we talk, we're talking, we clearly talking about role and um, pretending to be there, pretending not to be there, um, I should say. And uh, and we are normal. We are people, um, and we and our presence should be noted in some in some way, shape, or form. Um, really interesting. My first webinar. Good to see connections um, with Dean and Pollard. Um, helps me put it all together. Pleased that um, that we can't pretend we're not there, and that there's a model to help clarify how present we can be. So thank you for bringing this into my life and my professional practice, which is a fantastic piece of feedback. Extremely interested and enjoyable. Um, please pass on my appreciation. Um, I wish I was going to UCLan this weekend. Very informative webinar. Thank you, Robert. Fab, thank you. Very helpful and practical. So uh, absolutely fantastic feedback. So thank you so much, Robert. I'm sure that, well, based on your feedback, you'll agree it's been a fantastic webinar. Um, and I'm sure one that if I could persuade Robert to, we could stretch over to a number of other webinars. If that would be something you'd be interested in, audience, please pop some yeses in the question boxes because um, we've only really just touched on the surface of it this evening. Um, and I'm sure that we could go into much more detail in, in the whole, it, within the whole sort of process. Fantastic, lovely. Um, so I, I think, I think clearly it's about considering our presentation of self. Um, and one of the questions earlier was alluding to prep and whether we should take that into consider consideration in prep. And yeah, we should when we're prepping, but also when we arrive, um, quickly assessing on arrival, checking whether what we had thought in our heads when we imagine this interaction happening was actually the real life version of it um so the virtue of prepping means that we are brought to that level of awareness we have that on our mind and we actually are thinking about that when we arrive at the booking as well um and that's the whole joy of prepping the more we pretend we're not there um the more weird it is which is so real and and that leading to the detriment detrimental to the perception of the deaf person because of the way that we're behaving and moving out of our role stepping out of role uh, in that sense is actually creating behaviors that are not expected um, and the consequences of that so just just really really powerful stuff um, so thank you very very much um, for this evening Robert you'll see on your screens um, it's quite scary to consider that we only have three more webinars this year and in fact it's then going to be Christmas which is quite overwhelming I think um, as you can see here in October we have Robin Dean presenting on the 14th Beyond Deontology, which will be another amazing webinar. Then moving on to Deafblind Interpreting Attributes by Barry Allen Davy, and then What to Charge, which I'm sure will be um, very topical um, considering um, all the Scrap the Framework campaigns and things by Nubsley, um, and uh, as we all know, recent cuts to access to work. So three fantastic webinars. So all you need to do is pop on there and book on. Um, if you would like to rave about our webinars, we would also love that. <laughs> please feel free. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. And if you want to spread the word, please do pop onto our Facebook page, rave about how great they are. And please do tell other people because we are running these webinars for your benefit. And we really, really want to get to as many people as possible so we can share this amazing stuff. So I hope that you've enjoyed this evening as much as I have. And um, have a lovely evening and we'll be seeing you hopefully on another webinar very soon. Take care. Good night.